We begin where it all started and explore the old growth forest and find big cedar, a tree that survived 600 years, the progress of mankind and the logging industry of North Vancouver. My name is Karen Dearlove and I'm the curator of the North Vancouver Museum and Archives. Our museum and archives is dedicated to preserving the history of all of North Vancouver. And a lot of that history really started when the Europeans that first came to North Vancouver saw the great trees that were here, specifically Douglas fir and red cedars. These trees are what attracted the first settlers to this area and the first European industries in the area. This started with a mill that was established on the North Shore in the 1860s, and that mill became the Moodyville Mill, the Moodyville Company Town. And once they had exhausted the nearby trees, they started logging further and further up the slope. By the 1890s, trees were being harvested from up into the Lynn Valley and Rice Lake area. And the trees that were being harvested included the Douglas fir, which were very tall, straight, hardwood trees that were excellent trees for building ship masts, and the red cedars. The red cedars, because they were easy to split and resistant to insects and to rot, were especially useful for building houses in and around the Vancouver area. We have on the display here some of the tools that were used to harvest these trees by hand. These included the double-bitted axe, which was actually specifically used in West Coast logging. Over here we have a large two-person crosscut saw. And one of the other innovations that was peculiar to West Coast logging were the springboards. And the process to cut down some of these large trees meant that you had to put notches in the trees about five feet from the ground in order to insert the springboards. And this is because the trees, the trunks of the trees, were at a curve till about five feet from the ground. Now we're really seeing something. We never witnessed a better team in the Shottish. No, that isn't the Shottish, it's the polka. No, it's the wolf. No, it's the two-step. Well, take your choice. Anyway, we call that real teamwork. It's a he-man's game, as one can readily see. And then they would take these trees to the various mills. But as they were cutting the trees from further and further up the slope into the Lynn Valley area, it became more efficient to build mills up in those areas to process the lumber at some stages before they had to bring it all the way down to Burrard Inlet and ship it off. And that's really why there was a community that grew up in Lynn Valley in, in the area that became known as Shaketown. Uh, Julius Frome became known as kind of the main pioneer of Shaketown. He bought the mills in around the Lynn Valley area um, around 1906, and it became known, uh, a lot of this area, as Shaketown because he built houses for the workers in and around the intersection of Mountain Highway and Lynn Valley Road. We also know a lot about this area, known as Shaketown, through one of the other pioneers, Walter Draycott. Draycott was born in England in 1883, and came to Canada as a young man around 1907, eventually moving his way westward to North Vancouver, where he settled in the Lynn Valley area in 1912. He served in the First World War, and he was an excellent artist, so he actually worked as a topographer for the Canadian military, which meant that he did surveys and helped to sketch out maps and uh, surveys of battlefields. And one of the reasons why we know so much about the history of Lynn Valley was through Draycott. He kept a diary almost every day of his adult life. 
Monday 9, April 1917. One of our planes shot down. At 5.20 a.m., our artillery opened up the barrage, also machine gun company. There's a regular hell on earth, truly a grand sight for us. The semi-darkness is lit up by bursting shells making sprays of red light. Our barrage lasts for one hour, 20 minutes. Fourth Division held up temporarily by wire. All the regiments reach their objective and Vimy Ridge is ours. Tis surprising how near one can be to shells when they burst, for two burst almost at my feet. I go up after and make a panorama sketch for the general. Lieutenant Bob is killed. And through his diary and his sketches and his own photographs, we know a lot about the area that became Lynn Valley. He talks also a lot about stories about Shaketown, um, about how difficult it was clearing the land and building homes in that area, how he built his own home using a lot of these types of handheld tools. And in fact, a lot of the tools that we have on display in our museum actually came from Walter Draycott's personal possessions. Homes would be covered in shingles made of red cedar, both for the roofs and for cladding on the walls. In order to transport the red cedar from way up the slope around Rice Lake, where a lot of the logging operations occurred, the owners of the mill built an intricate system of flumes. Flumes were basically troughs of wood that would be filled with water from sources like Rice Lake and from some of the different creeks along its path. And it would basically, they would float the wooden shakes and shingle bolts, which were just four and a half foot lengths of cedar all the way down from where they were logged to the different milling operations and eventually to Burrard Inlet. And so the flume system became a real feature of these early landscape in Lynn Valley and on the North Shore. And at the time the flumes were built, they actually had precedence over all other building activities. So homes, houses, and roads had to give way to the flumes. This is an interesting picture from 1909 showing Lynn Valley Road and basically the road and going over what is now Hastings Creek. And you can see here that the road actually had to dip underneath the flume, because the flume had the right of way. Similarly, homes had to be built around the path of the flume. And this is a great picture showing one of the homes that was built right next to the flume, where it was basically at the end of its path going down to Burrard Inlet. The flumes also became used in many aspects of daily life. A lot of the residents along its path drew their water from the flume, their water that they used for washing and for cooking. And they had to do that at specific times in which the flumes were not being used to transport lumber. There's also lots of stories that we hear, a lot of them that were collected by Walter Draycott, that talk about some of the accidents that happened around the flumes, even um, young children being swept away by the flumes, although some of them ended with happy endings, others did not so as well as adventurous youth that used to try to use the flumes as a way of transportation instead of taking the bumpy tote road down to the mouth of Burrard Inlet, they would try to walk or ride along the flumes instead, all of which was frowned upon by the owners of the flumes and the mills. But they did really become a feature of life on the North Shore in and around Lynn Valley specifically. When the cedar was transported to the mills, it had to be split into uniform sized and bundled together to be transported. Um, and it would be done so with a machine like this. This is a shingle bundler and it would take the, the shingles that were split from the cedar and bundle them together, compress them and wrap them with metal bands so that they could be transported. You can see here though, this how easily the cedar would split by just using what's called a fro, which is just a large metal knife that would be, would be hammered into the cedar to split it into these uniform sizes. Big cedar. It's one of the only trees not to be logged in the area and is approximately 600 years old. Taking a look at it, you get a good idea of what the forest would have looked like had it not been logged. We feel the presence of this old sentinel and the stories that played out on the mountain and also in the development 
of shakedown known as Lynn Valley. The leisurely way of yesterday is over. A new order has taken its place. Another era starts, a faster life, and the wheels of the world move on. <laughs>